Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome to my blog today. I'm excited because I've got a, you know, what I feel to be some important concepts for you with regard to the whole issue of food and drink and what should or shouldn't I eat and what do the experts say and is it scientifically validated or not? All of that kind of stuff. I think it's safe to say that every one of us has come to an awareness that Certain foods, often the ones we think we like, give us problems. And sometimes the foods we think we don't like are the ones that we really need, but for some reason keep avoiding. So I don't think it takes a genius to look out the window and see that we have more chronic disease than ever in the history of man. We have more obesity, diabetes, uh, sedentary people, overweight policemen, overweight soldiers, overweight nurses, overweight flight attendants. Uh, overweight athletes, uh, kids dropping dead, doing physical fitness examinations uh, that should be easy for anyone to do. Uh, you know, the list just goes on and on and on, which is, you know, quite entertaining. Certainly gives me lots of work to do, so I'm grateful for that. So let's take a look today at how to meet and essentially manage your food dragons. Now I could speak on this forever and that's what I teach my holistic lifestyle coaching programs level one, two, and three, four. So it's just a brief introduction into yet one of the many facets of the things that I teach in my advanced training programs. We will refer to my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy in a little while where I'll show you how to use one of the diagrams to address the kinds of issues we're going to address today. So the first thing I want to do is get clear on what a dragon is in the context that I'm using it as a food dragon. Here you can see my uh, Tai Chi symbol. In yin I have unconscious and in yang I have conscious. Uh, relatively speaking, if you're conscious, I'm conscious of my hand, therefore there it is, but I'm, shall we say, unconscious of the actual origin of my hand and my body would be an example. I'm conscious that I'm using my speed speedometer, but I'm unconscious of how it works inside. So the unconscious certainly is alive and well in all of us, and it's far vaster than the conscious. If you look at research on the ego, they say it's about, if it was a peer, uh, an iceberg, the ego is about five to eight percent of the iceberg that you could see above the water, and the unconscious represents everything under the water. That would be a kind of a Freudian approach to that. So we have two types of dragons. We have dragons that we create unconsciously. We'll call that a black dragon. And we have dragons that we create consciously. We'll call that a white dragon. An example of a consciously created dragon is believing in something even when the facts, as I'll show you, don't support um, what your belief is. Uh, and so, for example, if you believe that pasteurized milk is the only way to go, then you run the risk of creating a white dragon because you're projecting a belief that ultimately, as I'll show you, may be leaving uh, footprints and bite marks all over your body. So either of these are really departures from ideal, and in Paul Check for Doctor language, a dragon is created whenever you're thinking or acting in a way that is not congruent with living your stated dream. So to the degree that you're getting negative symptoms drinking pasteurized milk and it's causing you the kinds of problems I'll talk about, then you're creating a black dragon or an unconscious dragon to the degree that you believe you're doing the right thing and you're ignoring the symptoms you're creating, shall we say, a yang or a, a white dragon. Either of them are deviations from balance is what I'm saying. So my definition of a dragon, dragons are virtual beings of spirit, enlivened by one's conscious or unconscious drives, motives, intentions, or values. Dragons are comfortable living in or acting within our shadows, and they leave traces as symptoms. So just like the wind leaves traces on the desert as the patterns in the sand, and though you don't see the wind, you see its footprints, when you look at your physical, emotional, and mental symptoms, you're seeing the footprints and the bite marks of your dragons, many of which come from food. Okay, so now we're 
we're going to use what is sometimes referred to as Jung's psychological compass as a means of explaining where a lot of us create dragons unconsciously or potentially consciously without realizing it. Jung showed that thinking, sensation, feeling, and intuition were four essential components of consciousness and that in order to essentially navigate life and have a balanced perspective on things so we don't dupe ourselves, we needed to at minimum look at these thinking, intuition, sensation, and feeling functions and the more important a decision is to you, the more important it is to be aware of these things because as I'll show you, to the degree that any of these are disabled, you basically have more unconscious expression of yourself and you get sort of ready, fire, aim behaviors and wonder, my God, why did they do that? Why did they say that? Oh my God, I'm getting demoted, I'm getting divorced, <laughs> whatever it might be, okay? So as a model to understand the concept that I'm sharing here, identifying a food dragon, I'm just choosing milk since that's sort of a universal problem. You could put white sugar in there, you could put canned food, plastic bottled water, uh, medical drugs of most types. So this is just a model. What you should do if you want to use the little lesson I'm sharing with you today is write down everything you're eating for seven days, like I teach in HLC training, and then write down the things that you most often eat. Start with the three things you eat the most often or the most of. So if you like grazing on nuts all the time, you probably have a nut problem. If you are you know, addicted to milk and think it's the end all be all, you better write it down. If you like, uh, if you think uh, you're a fructarian or a vegan, then you write down what you eat the most often. It doesn't matter how you get there. Usually it's your most eaten foods that are your biggest dragons and contain the most misunderstandings about thus the patterns that lead to the problems. And lo and behold, what do you see? I have all sorts of people come to me that say, oh, I'm a vegan. I don't have anything wrong with my diet. I just need you to help me with my digestion and my elimination. Oh, okay. Or I'm a vegetarian. I don't need your help with diet. I just need you to help me lose all this weight I've got. Yes, but you're, <laughs> you're overweight, swollen, full of heat signs, and your tests show me that you're protein deficient. So there you go. These are... You can not only can you have a food item in there, you can put a dogma in there quite easily. Okay, so let's take a look now. This is Jung's psychological compass. Let's look at exactly what we need to be aware of to have a holistic viewpoint on any food, in this case, that may or may not be supporting us. Thinking is the cognitive, it relates to cognitive thought. I'm thinking, I'm talking, I'm aware of that. That's cognition. It tells us what general concepts and what context facts can be placed. For example, pasteurized milk is or isn't a food. Thinking tells us what it means. So through thinking, we make the distinction that pasteurized milk is or isn't a food or raw milk is or isn't a food. And this tells us what it means in regard to the context and the available facts. But that information alone doesn't always help because a lot of the people that think these things out turn out not to live in accordance with their thoughts. For example, lots of people think God is love or God is unconditional love, but they are the first people to sign up to petition uh, an abortion clinic or, you know, things like that. So that you see they're, they're missing other faculties here. The functional antagonist, the yin-yang relationship of thinking comes to feeling, Feeling tells us whether we like the facts or not. It will or I will or won't drink pasteurized milk is a feeling. Now these are not as logical as you might think. That's why I'm giving you these examples. Jung was quite scientific in his approach, so it's not always logical unless you have enough depth of understanding. But as the model goes, again, feeling tells us whether or not we likes the fact, like the facts or not. It will or won't, I will or won't drink pasteurized milk. That's a feeling, okay? As you can see, your feeling is going to be based on thinking because if you've been programmed with an idea, all oh, pasteurized milk is bad, you're actually gonna shut down your feeling sense. 
And you may be projecting your unconscious beliefs into the experience you're having. Therefore, you're not actually feeling very much. Feeling tells us uh, what is worth, what it is worth to us. So what is pasteurized or unpasteurized milk worth to us? It relates to our values. In other words, I feel really good that I'm supporting a local dairy farmer. There's a feeling function. I feel very good um, that my diet is working well. There's a feeling function. Okay? Now, on the functional antagonist here of sensation and intuition play out like this. Sensation tells you what the facts are via your sense organ. So for example, the milk tastes good or bad. Uh, sensation tells us that it exists. So this is important. Oftentimes feeling and sensation are confused. Your feeling relates to your thoughts and your values, but your sensation is this jug is hard, it's made of glass, the jug is cold, and it's got dew on it. Those are sensations that can give you facts. This jug exists, it has weight, it has, that's that, okay? There it is, it's sent, you have that sensation, it tells that it exists. Now on the other side of that is intuition. Perception via, perception, intuition is perception via the unconscious, where it tells you where facts come from, where they may lead to, and the possible connections. Okay, it tells us um, what may be done with the possibilities. So, for example, if your thinking is oriented around uh, publicly traded concepts of pasteurized milk, it's good for you, raw milk's dangerous, you'll get a bacterial infection, then you may or may not like the facts you know that you're drinking milk, but the dragon's footprint may make you realize that something needs to change in order for me to feel the way that I want to feel. So the, whenever the dragon leaves footprints, it's always an invitation to look to see if we're missing part of it. Then by using intuition, we can say, well, I've read everything they said about pasteurized milk, but I'm feeling as though I need to change my values because... <laughs> The facts of sensation are that I'm having problems. So if you look at each element of the compass, it gives you some piece of information that's needed to make a holistic decision about whether or not it's good for you or not. Now, once you go through the process, if you continue not to do it, it just means that your dragons are very well alive and they're very, very strong and that they're nourishing off a lot, which often means you have to dig deeper that I can go into in a short little presentation like this. So now we know that the dragons are virtual beings of spirit enlivened by one's conscious or unconscious drives, motives, intentions, and values. We know that in order to think holistically and make good decisions about food and identify where our food dragons are, it's wise to use Young's four qualities in the consciousness compass, which is thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition. So now we come to what I call, or what is sometimes called in psychological circles, name it and tame it, right? If you have an anger problem and you name it, my, we'll call my anger my red bull, when you feel it rising up, you can say, ah, oh, there's my red bull. I'm gonna talk to the red bull. Calm down, there's no need to run around and break things up. We don't wanna you know, end up causing more trouble than it's worth, etc. So. Once you can name it, you can really go a long ways towards recognizing it because now it's up out of the unconscious. Now the dragon's heads come up above the surface. You see the dragon, you can begin to work with the dragon. So now let's go ahead and work on the concept of pasteurized milk. People have been told that it's good for them. They've been sold all sorts of stories about it. They develop their own values based on what they believe. They know it's real because they're drinking it or they're not, but to, to not, you gotta know it's real. And then most people in our culture, unfortunately, seriously lack intuition because they keep on believing this, abiding by this, but ignoring the fact that what they're experiencing that tells them whether it's true or not is really not working out for them. 
So here's an example. Someone drinks pasteurized milk because they believe in all the propaganda. Uh, they've been told it's true. Or they watch somebody on the internet that uh, says you should drink milk, uh, use orange juice, and even eat sugar because uh, somebody's physiological riddle tells you that it should. Well, first and foremost, look to see if there's dragon footprints floating around. So some of the symptoms then, my digestion or elimination are disrupted. My skin, I'm having skin problems, pimples, breakouts, fungal appearances, whatever it may be. My energy levels, how are they? My mental clarity, how is the mental clarity going? My creativity, are you able to meet and manage your dragons. To meet and manage your dragons, you have to have some not only level of creativity, but you have to have enough, enough sex energy, enough life force energy to engage with something that may be easy to suppress and say, not right now, I'm too busy mourning over my <laughs> shitty day or whatever it might be. Okay? So your creative energy and your sex energy and your sex energy also means your sex energy. I mean, I've got 19 year old young men contacting me, asking me how to get off of Viagra, which is a, you know, not a good indicator of the health of our young population. And if we don't have good sex energy, then we run into a problem of our creative potential being stifled and we keep doing things that we always did even when they're not working. So if you look at, at the, you know, the world we see in, particularly in the Western culture, Sex energy is so low, people keep doing the same things over and over again. Like sending their kids to institutions that don't teach very well. And buying drugs that don't work very well and are worse. They kill you, etc, etc. Okay? My body shape. If your philosophy is so good, your veganism, your vegetarianism, your carnivorism, your caveman diet, your primal diet, your Atkins diet, your Ornish diet, your Pritikin diet, your South Beach, all of these things are all just different concepts that people buy into hook, line, and sinker without looking at the fact that their bodies are often swollen and showing heat signs, which means there's inflammation in the body. You know, if you look in the mirror in the morning and you're losing muscle definition, and you've got bags under your eyes, and your head's foggy, and your body looks and feels swollen, those are heat signs. That means you're inflaming yourself significantly, which produces a long, long list of knock-on problems. Um, you might be swollen and cold. Your typical hypothyroid patient who's ignored the swollen and hot, or in all fairness, hasn't ignored it, but has been running around trying to get help, and the advice isn't working. Why? Because most of the people you're getting advice from have these symptoms and they operate as health and medical practitioners out of their own dragonology, which is, uh, you know, demonstrated in their body, their mind, and their lifestyle. This is why it said never judge a man by the creed he or she professes, but by the life he or she leads, because the proof's in the pudding. Uh, you may have, you may be feeling tired and wired. You might be a skinny little person that's all jacked up. I, you may be hyperthyroid or, or adrenal overstimulated. Um, you could be hungry looking, which is, you know, maybe uh, too skinny or even anorexic if you want. How is your sleep quality? Almost Anything you eat that irritates your body and inflames your body runs the risk of disrupting sleep quality because inflammation produces the elevation of glucocorticoids, which stimulate, stimulate the sympathetic system, which are antagonistic to the parasympathetic system and the release of melatonin and the anabolic hormones that come out in the sleep, which I tell you all about in my chapter on sleep and how to eat and be healthy. How's your movement? Is, for example, consuming pasteurized milk or raw milk enhancing the freedom of your body is inflammation going away or is it getting worse is arthritis improving or getting worse are all of these symptoms improving or getting worse if these are getting worse it means the dragon's leaving bite marks on you and has a hold of you and that dragon 
isn't going to be addressed by the medical system at large because those are very, very profitable dragons. Those dragons make the cash register just go cha-ching, cha-ching. And so, you know, like I often say, the doctor's more than happy to cut something out of you because you don't get to choose the color of the new BMW you just bought for the doctor, um, which couldn't be purchased by your dragons. So am I free or am I impaired? Now, in conclusion, if you go to my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, um, in the chapter number three, the no diet diet, there's a chart I call the tachometer chart. And the tachometer chart gives you a power zone, which is depicted in blue in the middle based on the optimal working range of an engine, the power zone. If you shift too soon, the engine's weak. If you shift too late, you risk damaging the engine and you're out of the power zone. So metabolically, if we're revved up too high, too much stimulation, usually carbohydrate, sugar, or we're bogged down, too much fat, animal flesh, fat, protein in general, somewhere in between, we're going to have to balance out. This is very important because many of the people misunderstand not only Bill Walcott, but myself, that a metabolic type is not a prescription written in stone. So when you're taking a test on your primal pattern type, and maybe it says you're a protein type, those statistics or figures for eat two portions of animal flesh or something with eyeballs to one portion of no eyeballs, that's a starting point. That is not a prescription. Metabolic typing or primal pattern typing is an invitation, an invitation to engage in a relationship with your body, which requires the use of thinking, sensation, feeling, and intuition, because those are essential components of consciousness itself. So just like if I blinded you in one eye or covered one ear, you would be less aware of your environment, more likely to bang into things. If we approach food and drink with a perceptual or a cognitive blind spot, then we can keep on professing that this milk or that milk is good for us, but not realizing we're walking around with dragon bites all over us and, and uh, dragon footprints on our face and on our bellies and on our backs and in our arthritic painful joints. So to remind everybody, my last four doctors you'll ever need how to get healthy now shows you how to manage your feeling and your thinking components by getting clear on what values feel good to you relative to the dream you're ready to create day to day in your life right now. So we have to have the right information in the right context to create the values that feel good to us relative to our dream. We have to know if it's there or not. Are the facts there? Can we do it? Um, what do we know about ourselves that lets us know our dream exists as a possibility, for example? And we have to be able to look at the connections between what we're trying to accomplish where we've gone and what our potential is for any given thing. So what is the potential for pasteurized milk to be beneficial? What is the potential for it to be destructive? And you do the same thing with raw milk and you find out that lo and behold, raw milk may not work for everyone and pasteurized milk may, milk may not work for everyone and milk of any type may not work for anybody. So your value system has got to be integrated to the facts of what is being taught, what is being felt, what is intuited, and what you are seeing as symptoms. I know that's quite a lot. Everyone's always in a hurry, so I'm trying to give it to you in a fairly succinct manner, but since every one of you today is used to being on computers and the internet, you're moving at light speed. I had to meet you and match you in my pace today. So my suggestion is, if you're finding this quick and this information is complicated, it's very simple. Rewind the tape. Take your time. Sometimes it's worth going through five or six times. Writing notes. Pay attention to what I'm talking about that's going on in your life. And ask yourself, do I use my intuition? Do I actually meditate on things? Do I truly think about things or I just, do I just believe shit written on magazines and said on television? Do I trust my senses or aren't my body so clogged up and detox and, and full of toxicity that I can't even feel my cell phone? If you can't feel your cell phone, 
which to me feels like a miniature nuclear force field, then I can tell you you're blocked in your sensation. So thanks for joining me today. Hope you enjoyed this little blog on meeting and managing your food dragons. I look forward to sharing more with you next week, most likely. I'm Paul Check. Thanks for joining me today.